I am so thrilled to introduce our day two keynote, um, Lillian Tang. I first encountered Lillian, I don't remember when, but I think it was when we were both in government. Um, she was previously an NCIS agent. Yes, I believe that NCIS. And I have just had the pleasure of crossing paths with her so many times throughout our careers. Um, Lillian is one of those people that you'd meet and you just kind of get the sense that she is a force to be reckoned with. If I were an adversary, I would be afraid of her uh, for good reason. And um, then I've had the chance to kind of work with her a little bit over in her, her role at Yahoo, leading threat investigations for the paranoids, which if you haven't heard of that team, um, they do some really, really cool work against some pretty bad adversaries. Um, and on a personal note, this topic is so crucial. Um, I think so often, in the world we're in right now, diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion can become buzzwords. But as hopefully everyone here knows, these things are core for intelligence and cyber threat intelligence. And that's why I am so thrilled to have Lillian here to talk to us about why that is. So Lillian, welcome. Go ahead, kick things off. Thank you for the awesome introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are from. Uh, my name is Lillian Tang, uh, Chen Li Ling in Chinese. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick intro about myself. Full disclosure, opinions are my own, not reflective of my company. Um, I will have to say the Yahoo Paranoid is one of the awesomest cybersecurity organizations out there, if not just for the name. Um, I use she and her pronouns. And I'm speaking to you from Maryland, which is the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. A little bit about myself. I grew up right here in Maryland. I am a graduate of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, Go Hoyas. Post 9-11 in 2003, like Katie said, I joined the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Before anyone asked, it was just like the TV show, but cooler. Uh, as a cyber special agent, um, I learned host space and network forensics and began tracking government backed actors really, really back in the day. I served overseas in both the Middle East and Asia. And after leaving NCIS in 2011, I joined Booz Allen, which I affectionately call the Diet Coke of government. And with Booz Allen, I work at the National Cyber Joint Investigative Task Force, as well as the FBI's cyber division. Asia Cyber Operations section. After over 10 years in government, I decided I wanted to try my luck at private sector, and I joined Yahoo as one of the first members and eventually the leader of the advanced cyber threats team. Again, tracking government backed hackers. I was subsequently promoted to the role I'm in now, which is the Director of Threat Investigations, where I oversee multiple teams who are passionate about protecting our Yahoo users from malicious threats on the internet. In addition to this, over my tenure at Yahoo, I served as the global operations or the co-lead of Elevation, our AAPI employee resource group. I am Chinese, I'm a cis woman in tech, and I'm a mom in tech. And why does that matter? Uh, it matters because I'm often the triple only, where I may be the only person in the room who is one, two, or all three of these identities. I'm often faced with the glass ceiling, which is the invisible barrier to advancement that women face at top levels of the workplace. The bamboo ceiling, which is the barriers that exclude many Asians and Asian Americans from executive positions. And also this concept of the maternal wall. This is the bias that impacts a lot of mothers or pregnant women to be viewed as less competent and less committed to their jobs. I'm here today to talk to you about diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging and why this is vital to cyber threat intelligence. I'll be giving you some tips and tricks for how to consider these principles in your day-to-day, -day, whether you're an individual contributor or a leader. Uh, to quote Verna Myers, who is a renowned diversity and inclusion expert and VP of inclusion strategy at Netflix, diversity is been being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And when we talk about diversity, many automatically think specifically along gender and racial lines, often because this is the data that's most readily available, collected, and reported. 
I would caution you to recognize that none of these identities is a monolith. For example, I identify as AAPI, but that community represents over 50 countries. In my experience as a first generation Chinese American, this is very different from a Hmong refugee. And although we're technically both AAPI, we have very different perspectives. With this example, what I'm asking is for everyone to realize that diversity is much more nuanced, and that multiple things can contribute to building diverse perspectives. These experiences, such as sexual orientation, economic status and marginalization, immigration, neurodiversity, ability, and even caregiving. When I think about diversity, it's not necessarily to seek out certain populations to tokenize, which I'll talk about later. It's seeking a non-homogenous group. Recall Rebecca's keynote yesterday. If you didn't catch it, please watch it on replay. Uh, she described seven various desired cognitive skills. There is no way one person is gonna have them all. And if you do, your head will probably explode. Um, so how do you get these skills and how do you embody them in your team? You find people of different experiences and backgrounds who think these different ways. Going back to the party analogy, I'm gonna lean into a conversation I had with my colleague, Cindy Young, who's Yahoo's head of product inclusion, who I'm gonna give credit to. She made me this beautiful graphic because I stink at graphics. I could not figure out how to make a Venn diagram and she just manifested this and it's beautiful. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna walk you through this really quickly. Diversity is inviting a non-homogenous population to attend, representing a wide variety of lived experiences. Inclusion is making sure that the multiple perspectives were solicited and included for the party planning. Equity is where everyone is provided adequate transportation to the party, public transit, walking, driving, and belonging is where everyone is able to bring their authentic selves and dance, participate however they want. I want to quickly touch on why there is a shift to including belonging here. I mentioned this earlier, but there is this concept of tokenism. And I'm going to just quote Miriam Webster. They have a really great definition, which is the practice of doing something, such as hiring a person who belongs to a minority group, only to prevent criticism and give the appearance that people are being treated fairly. Hiring a person and then forcing them to represent an entire population is not recognizing them as a whole person. Think of it this way, it's a bit of a shift. It's shifting from what we've been taught as kids, the golden rule, treat others how you wanna be treated to something called the platinum rule, which is treat others how they want to be treated. So there have been a multitude of studies done over the course of the years on the effectiveness of diverse teams and leadership. For example, McKinsey and Company has been tracking this issue for almost a decade. Their 2019 results, which are pictured in this slide, again show that diverse representation literally equals profits. In their research, companies with more than 30% women executives were likely to outperform companies where the percentage of women executives range from only 10 to 30. In turn, those companies, the 10 to 30 range, were more likely to outperform those with even fewer women executives or none at all. Of note, a 48% differential separates the most from the least gender diverse companies. That's a lot of money. Additionally, McKinsey observed a consistent trend where the likelihood of outperformance continues to be higher for diversity in ethnicity than for gender. In 2019, top quartile companies outperformed those in the fourth quartile by 36% in profitability. So again, leaving a lot of money on the table there. Another company, Cloverpop, who specializes in decision-making software, uh, also did an interesting study on diversity in decision-making. Why is this important? Decision-making correlates to business performance. The better your decision-making capability is, the better the company performance is. So their research showed that inclusive decision-making leads to better business decisions up to, wait for it, 87% of the time. Business teams are able to drive decision-making twice as fast with half the meetings 
And in this age of meeting fatigue, half the meetings, I'm sold. And decision outcomes are improved by about 60%. As the pandemic has moved much of the world online, cybersecurity has become even more relevant to the quote unquote everyday experience. From Zoom bombing to ransomware shutting down a healthcare system or a school system, security is top of mind. So how should we think about DEI and B relevant to cybersecurity and CTI? Well, cybersecurity is one of the few fields where there is a consistent negative or zero unemployment rate. That means there are often more jobs than there are people to do them. One statistic I recently read was that in 2021, the world's open cybersecurity positions is enough to fill 50 NFL stadiums. And I'm not actually a football fan. I don't know how many that is, but I imagine it's quite a lot of roles. Uh, adding to this, there's this context of the great resignation that's going on, where multiple shifts in the workplace are occurring from a labor shortage due to those who are economically marginalized demanding a living wage, to caregivers like myself, who are often, often disproportionately women, being forced to choose between loved ones and work or juggle both, to mental health where we're now living at work, and the overwhelming fatigue and burnout any feel from living through March, I think it's 695th, 2020. That's a lot of challenges to overcome, but incorporating DEI and B principles can help. According to Forbes, 44% of people they surveyed said that candidates have turned down an interview or a job due to lack of diversity in the company's workforce. A huge majority of the workforce, 78%, says it's important to them to work at an organization that prioritizes diversity and inclusion. And in fact, more than half, 53%, consider it to be very important to them. So these numbers reflect how we must incorporate these principles to be able to recruit talent, to fill the 50 NFL stadiums of roles that we have. Additionally, specifically in cyber threat intelligence, we face dedicated human adversaries. They're not taking a break. They're not going anywhere. Many of them are tasked to breach your organization. Some of them to put food on their tables. Some of them to avoid prosecution. Some of them just like to watch the world burn. Now, how's that for a bunch of varied motivation? To cite a portion of the SANS definition of CTI, malware is an adversary's tool, but the real threat is the human one. And cyber threat intelligence focuses on countering those flexible and persistent human threats with empowered and trained human defenders. While we talk about technologies and tools, as this, de de as this definition demonstrates, central to this field is the humans involved. If we do not understand the experiences of our adversaries, we will not be able to protect our organizations from them. I'll give you a small example. I recall in the early days of my career, a conversation I had with a network defender. This defender was freaking out because they could not figure out why the activity of a particular adversary had seemingly disappeared. They checked all of their detections, all of their logs, and they're all up and running, but the defender was baffled. Well, I cheated. I looked at a calendar and said, hey, guess what? It's Chinese New Year. And our adversary, the Chinese APG group, was probably celebrating this holiday right now. And for more fun tales, such as the one I just shared, please catch the replay of my former Booz Allen colleague, Nate Beach Westmoreland's talk from yesterday on the importance of dates. And also for any Asian APT trackers out there who weren't all, already aware, Lunar New Year starts this weekend. Gong Shi Fa Sai. Lastly, we must understand and listen to vulnerable populations and the people we are charged with protecting. Civil society and marginalized identities often serve as canaries in the coal mine for security features, as the first targeted and sometimes the most vulnerable. An example of this was a running app that tracked and publicly posted the running routes of their users in their profiles. Numerous women and activists pointed out that this could be leveraged to stalk people. Of note, according to the National Coalition for Domestic Violence, one in every six women and one in every 19 men in the United States have been stalked at some time in their lifetime. 
So this company ignored these concerns. What really got them to the table was the US government, who realized that these routes that were being published publicly were revealing where sensitive military installments were around the world. And this is just one critical example, to quote my friend Lauren Buda, founder and CEO of Girl Security, of how girl security is national security. So what do we do about this? A lot of what I'm talking about underlying it is bias, which we're gonna talk about here. In cyber threat intelligence, we have many structured analytical techniques to ensure objective and data-driven conclusions. These were created so we can avoid certain biases in our analysis. But biases are so fundamental to who we are as people and often originate from societal, structural, or cultural reasons. They aren't all necessarily bad, but they're things we should be mindful of and how they appear in certain situations. There are many types of biases that exist. I believe Katie and Melanie had a slide about it in their talk. Um, there, there are just so many out there, you can't possibly cover them all in 45 minutes. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about some specific ones that I have observed within the industry that we need to watch out for. So the first one is conformity bias. So here, you're pressured to agree with others you agree. You may second guess your original thoughts, ideas, or decisions based on feedback from others. Of note, I do want to call out here that this bias presents specifically in certain identities, such as being an immigrant or first generation, because you are pushed to strive to conform or assimilate into the society or environment that you are now in, in order to basically survive and live. Another example where this manifests is in the hiring process, where members of an interview panel are influenced by the feedback and source of others. Now, one process that I use when I hire is specifically to mitigate this bias. I document my feedback in my source first, and then I ask the interview team to individually provide me their scores without the context of the rest of the team. And this way, no one is peer pressured to raise or lower a score for a candidate. The next bias that I'm gonna talk about is affinity bias or similarity bias. This type of bias leads you to form deeper connections with someone where you share a perceived relationship or share a perceived connection with. Most people unconsciously surround themselves with those who have similarity with them. And this often manifests in groupthink. Uh, you can see this reflected in gatekeeping behavior, which I'll talk about in a few slides. The next bias is beauty bias. Now, this is a bias where somebody who is considered traditionally beautiful is unconsciously viewed more favorably. And one obvious manifestation of this is the booth babe, or the promotional model phenomenon that still occurs at conferences and trade shows today. Another bias that's somewhat similar to this is the name bias. It's where a name which is perceived as different or foreign or difficult to produce is not viewed as favorable. For example, my parents who are immigrants told me that they named me Lillian, an anglicized version of my Chinese name, Li Ling, to make things easier for me to growing up in America. Contrast effect. Now this bias occurs when two options are compared against each other, vice assessed individually. Again, this manifests quite often in the hiring process, such as during a resume review or interviewing, where candidates are being assessed against each other and not objective criteria. Often, this bias is not intentional. It's a way our, our brains have kind of a mental shortcut. Because we are inundated with resumes or interviews or information, it's a way to help us process information. The last bias, but certainly you know, not the least, is confirmation bias. Now, this is the tendency to find, interpret, judge, and retain information that supports one's pre-existing views and ideas. This bias can make people less likely to engage with information which challenges their view. The most obvious example of this has been at the forefront of conversations pertaining, or pertaining to social media, social media bubbles, and technology in general. So how do you break these biases? Well, you guessed it. 
uh, seek out and interact with a diverse population and multiple experiences. Get out of your bubble, see things through a new lens. Now, this is often one of the most meaningful and powerful ways to uncover our personal bias. But that being said, it has become increasingly challenging in this COVID world that we live in. With social distancing, people with varying risk tolerances, some people are primarily engaging online and others are more comfortable being in person. You have to find your own path. So let's pivot a little and let's talk about some major players in the CTI space who have already begun recognizing these issues and adopting measures to improve. For example, Lockheed Martin, I affectionately call them a stuffy uh, defense contractor, sorry Lockheed, uh, known in the CTI world for the kill chain model, has gender representation among its executive team approaching 40%. According to the McKinsey study I re referenced earlier, Lockheed employed some really key actions to encourage their diversity. So they set enterprise-wide targets for gender representation. They took on a talent evaluation process that's conducted through an external partner to try and eliminate unconscious bias in hiring, succession planning, and promotions. They did novel immersive learning to shift people's behavior and foster this sense of belonging. They did data gathering via focus groups, anonymous employee feedback, exit surveys to inform decision-making and targets. Another critical piece is that these efforts didn't just come from HR or the DEI and B team. Lockheed's executives bought in with the CEO serving as the lead champion for this in setting expectations. This structured and universal approach is particularly important. A 2016 study in the Academy of Management Journal demonstrated that women, gender minorities, and BIPOC leaders who engage in DEI and B activities were rated much worse on performance evaluations than their white male counterparts who engaged in similar activities. So having a program where this is universally applied will help mitigate this particular challenge. Another example here is MITRE, which is known for MITRE ATT&CK and MITRE ENGAGE frameworks. They created an awesome Autism at Work program called the Portal Project. Uh, the project provides training, not only to employees on the autism spectrum, but to their coworkers and managers. By modifying the onboarding and support process for employees on the spectrum and educating their colleagues, they seek to improve communication and encourage creative perspectives. This enhanced perspective will also benefit current employees, including those already on, those on the spectrum. Now, the exciting thing is this program was expanded. And in 2021, the Neurodiverse Federal Workforce Pilot Program began running at the National Geospatial Agency. Now, why is this important? Well, a disproportionate amount of neurodivergent people experience economic marginalization or poverty. A federal government job has been a demonstrated way for marginalized communities to break the poverty cycle for them and their future generations. So you do the math here. And right here at the SAM Summit, the graphic recording for visual learners acknowledges that there are multiple learning styles. And yesterday, the coolest thing ever happened, the SAM CTI Summit in Espanol. The impact of this is amazing in reducing barriers to knowledge and entry into a field. When I was growing up, English was not my first language. I distinctly remember one time asking my best friend a question. She kind of turned to me, gave me a funny look and responded, I don't speak Chinese. And this was the first time I realized I was different in operating in a different world. Can you guess how old I was? I was five years old. Many people who grow up speaking another language have very similar experiences. And the fact that SANS is recognizing this and creating content to make people feel like they belong holds a special place in my heart. Uh, coupled with amazing programs like the HBCU SANS Academy and partnerships with women and veterans organizations, they're helping to open doors 
for the next generation of cybersecurity practitioners. Now, I promised I would talk to you a little bit about gatekeeping. I think cybersecurity's favorite topic. We as an industry need to move to opening, not shutting doors. I've seen this manifested in so many ways, as I'm sure you have as well. The tension between IT and cybersecurity and this perception that you must pay your dues first in another field to work in cybersecurity. The hiring manager who doesn't take an opportunity to create a true entry level position in cybersecurity. The hiring manager that isn't willing to grow and retain talent. The job descriptions that are just copy and paste with unrealistic skill sets who do not account for non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, School of Foreign Service major, right here. Uh, economic barriers to entry in those job descriptions, such as requiring a degree or an advanced degree or certificates that are so expensive and often unattainable for economically marginalized groups. Underlying all of this is another type of bias, experience bias, where we as humans take our perception to be the objective truth. As a hiring manager or a recruiter or somebody on an interview panel, it's often human nature to reflect on your experience and incorporate that into your expectations or your job description or your candidate selection. And as referenced in Melanie and Katie's talk, structured, intentional hiring and interview processes will help you break this habit. So you finally made it through the first gate and gauntlet and you've gotten yourself a CTI job, congratulations. Now comes the dreaded trust group and that, that you also have to get into for your job. Taking a small tangent here, but be sure to check out Grace's amazing research and talk on CTI networking effectiveness later today at the summit. But going back to this concept of trust groups, you probably guessed where I'm going with this, but the biases that I flagged earlier, affinity bias, similarity bias, are alive and well in these groups. Oftentimes you have to be vouched to get in, which this behavior skews towards always bringing in the same type of perspective or experience because of the inherent trust. For these communities, I implore you, step back, audit your membership, take a close look at what perspectives you have and which ones are missing. Be very intentional about filling those gaps. And in recognition or maybe frustration of the difficulty of getting into these trust groups, Strides have been made to share information outside of those and create more inclusive, accessible communities. From Discord groups to engagement on various social media, the opportunities have definitely expanded, but there are underlying issues that may not be recognized. For example, I jokingly call myself a digital fossil. I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on TikTok. And while that's mostly true because I'm a fossil, I also want to call out that social media is not always a safe place for everyone and could actually be an invisible gate. A recent 2021 Pew Research study revealed that 41%, and I'm actually shocked this isn't higher, of all Americans have been harassed online. Of that 41%, 75% reported that harassment occurring via social media. According to that same Pew study, LGBTQIA plus adults are particularly susceptible to facing harassment online, with roughly seven in 10 having encountered any harassment at all, and more than half, 51%, being targeted for more severe forms of online abuse. In cybersecurity, Twitter often reigns supreme, but try and recognize that in 2018, Amnesty International published a study specifically on the toxic effects of Twitter for women and gender minorities. Highlights of that report include that 64% of women surveyed believe that online abuse or harassment of women is just common. You know, it's just the thing that happens. Um, a majority of those women, because of that, engage in self-censoring and they do that to protect themselves online. So most of these issues that I've talked about have been systemic gatekeeping challenges, which obviously are very difficult to overturn. But I'm also going to talk briefly about self-gatekeeping that sometimes also happens. And this is where you take yourself out of contention 
for a role or an opportunity. Oftentimes, this is a result of certain ingrained values. For example, I grew up in what is jokingly referred to as a tiger family. As a daughter of immigrants, I was taught to always excel, keep my head down, work hard, and wait for recognition. If the recognition didn't come, accept. Life is unfair and full of times where I would need to sue cool, swallow my bitterness, and carry on. For those who have been taught to internalize these values, we need to recognize and unlearn some of these tendencies. So I had a long conversation about this with my therapist, and she reframed it for me in a beautiful way, which I'm going to share with you here. So this imposter syndrome is your brain protecting you from being hurt. It's the voice of your fear and the fears of those before you, trying to protect you from future harm. It's also, honestly, the way you know you've chosen a path of growth. And once you learn to recognize this and appreciate it, you can begin to let it go and aim for that job or that promotion opportunity. And if you have trouble letting it go, because this is honestly sometimes a lifelong struggle, keep working on it but surround yourself with a network of friends, family, mentors, allies, who are gonna genuinely champion your strengths. So this kind of brings me to my next topic, which is fear. Now you may recall me mentioning I'm a mom in tech. You probably should have also guessed at that point that there was no way we were gonna escape this talk with at least one mention of Daniel Tiger. Oftentimes in cybersecurity, there's fear. Fear we're gonna hire the wrong person. Fear that we hire that wrong person doesn't work out. Fear we don't hire quickly enough and we lose the spot. Fear in the trust group that the person you vouched doesn't fit in. What I would say to this is lean into this particular Daniel Tiger song. It's a favorite of my three-year-old right now. She runs around our house singing along all day long, which goes, it's okay to make mistakes. Try to fix them and learn from them too. I'm not a great singer, but anyways, take a chance on that person with a non-traditional skill or background or a lived experience. Their perspective will enable you to identify blind spots and innovate to solve new problems. Examine your organization. Is there an opportunity to promote internally to increase representation for a specific role? Rather than looking at a person in terms of fitting in or culture fit, Look for culture add. Again, according to Cloverpop, their research, uh, the research that I mentioned earlier, you can see that diversity, it does increase friction by a very small amount. But look at the boost in results when you add inclusion, aka looking for culture add. It obviously outweighs that. So what are some tangible actions everyone can take? Well, first and foremost, mentorship is vital to the community. And Tanisha Martin, Executive Director of Black Girls Hack, gave an amazing speech at SANS Hackfest on this topic. I'm giving you all homework. Go find this on the SANS website or YouTube right now. I'll wait. Use your favorite search engine. Go on YouTube. Go on SANS. You need to watch this talk. So I'm going to expand a bit on Tanisha's talk. We need our community to move towards being sponsors. So this is putting social business capital towards retaining and advancing diverse practitioners. If you consider yourself an ally in this space, providing feedback, emotional support, and guidance through mentorship, absolutely vital. But we also need those doers, those who are using their capital external to mentorship people who are opening doors for others to walk through, especially those who may go unnoticed. The sponsor role works with the mentor or the protege, but there's an added component of influence where you're influencing an external audience or partner to help advance that protege. Now, this isn't the ultimate solution, but this is a tangible step that anyone can take. So what does this look like? I'm gonna use a framework by Rosalind Chow, who is Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory at Carnegie Mellon University. It's called the ABCDs of Sponsorship. So the A here is for Amplify, where you can create or increase an audience positive impressions. 
A great example of this in cybersecurity is the Share the Mic in Cyber campaign started by Lauren Zabrick and Camille Stewart to amplify Black cybersecurity practitioners. Another important thing to highlight about this particular campaign is the concept of making space, giving a marginalized voice the opportunity and platform to share their truth in their own words is powerful visibility. A more individualized approach you can take is when a marginalized person makes an important point or suggestion in a meeting. But that point is either ignored or immediately shot down or other step, so, you know, it, it's disregarded. So the action I'm asking is to step in, redirect back to that person's idea, give clear support and credit to its source. For example, you might say something like the following, I'd like to go back to what so-and-so said previously. This was a strong idea. It provided a number of great solutions that would move us forward or whatever. I support their approach and I can offer a few ways to help them make it happen. Now, this statement, oh, it forces others to listen. And it also keeps people from taking credit for ideas that are not their own. The B here, is for boost. And this is where you increase others' expectations of the, of the protege's potential and readiness, and you formally nominate them for an opportunity. This could be as simple as an employee referral, a letter of recommendation, a speaking engagement, or a nomination to that coveted trust group we were talking about. Another way you can demonstrate this is if you're a hiring manager, you're interviewing candidates, Look around your department, see what other roles are open. Sometimes job descriptions are not best written. Um, and somebody that applies for your role may actually be perfect for a different role in your department. Definitely feel comfortable referring them, taking that step and pushing them for that additional opportunity. The C here is for connect. And this is where you seek to increase the person's visibility by introducing them to people in your network who might help them in their goals. Some companies have gone so far as to institute formal sponsorship opportunities for new hires. They connect them to senior leaders who can regularly offer guidance and are actually positioned to accelerate their career. And for the leader, this reverse mentorship structure is a way to broaden their perspective and see the organization with fresh eyes. Now recall earlier, I had a slide where I said, not all bias is bad. And this is actually where I encourage you to leverage a particular bias called the halo effect, where one outstanding quality or accomplishment takes precedence over any negative attributes. In this case, you're the halo, and you can seek to cast your halo on the person or the group you're mentoring or sponsoring use your voice to give them visibility. And in fact, you may have noticed, I've been trying to do this throughout my keynote, referencing other speakers and voices here at SAILS. Lastly, the D is for defend, where you seek to reverse or neutralize others' uncertainty or negative perceptions of the protege. And this goes back to the title of my talk. Use your voice, challenge the negative perception provide an alternate explanation and protect this person from harmful exposures. An example of this is this common meme or misconception that I hate, which is that the talent pipeline is not diverse because these candidates don't exist. That's bullshit. Sorry, pardon my language. It's hundred percent untrue. These candidates are out there. And if you can't find them, it's on you. You're looking in the wrong spot. And if you need help finding these candidates, let me give you a hand right now. Women, go to Girls Security, Women's Society, Cyber Gypsy, Women in Security and Privacy, the Diana Initiative. Uh, for Black practitioners, Black in Tech, Black Cybersecurity Association, Afrotech. For the Latinx community, Techaria, best name ever. Uh, for the LGBTQIA plus community, Out in Tech, Lesbians in Tech. For the Veterans Community, VetSec, and the Hiring Our Heroes program. For caregivers, Path Forward, who is seeking to help caregivers who have taken a step back in their career get back into the field. Upwardly Global, this program helps immigrants and refugees with really vital skills step into those roles here right in the US. 
And these are just the organizations off the top of my head. And in case you need it, the Department of Interior Office of Civil Rights actually has a comprehensive list of all minorities serving academic institutions. So this will cover your historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and also AAPI serving institutions. So we've talked about a lot today. And if you're interested in rewatching this talk, uh, in a couple of weeks, I think we're going to be featured uh, on the SANS Diversity website, which is linked to this QR code. We're going to add some content there, maybe a blog post, who knows. Um, additionally, there's going to be a play at home edition, although technically I think we're all probably at home at this point, that will have additional reading and resources from my talk. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. <laughs>